Our scripture reading this morning is from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. The man said to Jesus, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor and you will, have, you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, children how hard it is to enter the kingdom of god it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of god they were greatly astounded and said to one another then who can be saved jesus looked at them and said for mortals it is impossible but not for god for god all things are possible Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Technical difficulties, sorry. Early in the week, um, headlines about the coronavirus epidemic focused mo mostly on the global economic impact. I heard stories about the airline industry, tourism, manufacturing, product shortages, interest rates, and of course, the stock market. Evidently, the 500 richest people in the world lost a combined $444 billion between Monday and Friday. On several evenings, I saw multiple news programs lead with market losses rather than deaths. I wonder if that trend may now shift since the first fatality in our country has been announced, but it might not. At least initially, the market decline has been the barometer of the crisis. I am not a financial expert, and I don't play one on TV, but I do know that the market hates uncertainty, and so it responds, sometimes dramatically and with costly results, to what it cannot predict or control, like an illness with no known cure that is spreading across the globe. We have a tendency, or at least I do, uh, to think of money and the material realm as being wholly objective and dispassionate. But it seems as though human sentiments, like anxiety and fear and greed, can drive a hugely emotional response from a system that is without a heart. And by without a heart, I don't mean cruel necessarily, but not human. An inanimate system 
reacting in a very human way. But wealth and material riches and the fear of losing them can sometimes evoke troubling human responses. I would invite you to be attentive to your own emotions this morning as I preach on a text about a rich man who asks what he must do to inherit eternal life and hears this response from Jesus. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor. And Jesus' follow-up commentary to the disciples is how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God and it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Anybody anxious yet? Well, the rich man clearly was. You know, we don't know who he was or if he ever shows up again. It's important to note that he was not like the Pharisees and scribes who asked Jesus trick questions in the hopes of entrapping him. The guy was sincere. He was not a jerk. He called Jesus good teacher, a title of honor, and he knelt before Jesus in an act of profound respect. This, a parallel story appears in the other synoptic gospels. In Matthew, he's identified as a rich young man, suggesting inexperience and naivete. And in Luke, he's called the rich ruler, suggesting political power. But in Mark, he's just called rich. And because that's the sole description, seems to be the whole point. When Jesus told him to sell his belongings and give his money to the poor, he was shocked, the text says, and then he was sad as he turned his back on Jesus and walked away. The man loved his stuff more than he loved eternal life. Mark's implication seems to be that wealth does something to people, and whatever it does, it's not positive. The man's query, what must I do to inherit eternal life, hints at the problem. Eternal life, the kingdom of God, is not a solitary quest or experience. It is the fullness of life on earth where it has already broken in and in heaven where it will be fully realized someday. And it is intended by God for the whole creation. But the man is only concerned with his personal salvation. And then he asks what he has to do to get the inheritance, failing to realize that an inheritance is a gift. It is not something he's entitled to, and it is not something that he can earn or buy. It is given by God and by the grace of God. Not even keeping the commandments, which the man declares to Jesus he's done since he was a kid, not even that gets him eternal life. But, but notice the law that Jesus asks him about. You shall not murder, commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Those are from tablet two that Moses brought down from the mountaintop, and they speak to life in community. The first four commandments that aren't mentioned here have to do with one's relationship with God. So Jesus is concerned about how we live in community. He is concerned about how the rich man lives in community. And that would seem to suggest that Jesus has experienced behavior and attitudes that wealth can evoke that have him concerned about how that interferes with our ability to live in community. Like riches can turn people's views inward or encourage individuality rather than community or focus our sights on our own abundance and reward without concern for others. 
There was an article in USA Today this very morning citing research, recent research in the Journal of Transport and Health indicating that most drivers don't yield when a pedestrian crosses the street, but drivers of expensive cars are the worst offenders. The study theorizes that many people who drive more expensive cars just don't care about the people who are crossing the street, and maybe wealthy drivers simply felt a sense of superiority over other road users. In his encounter with the rich man, Jesus shows compassion. The text says he loves him. The rich man is the only person in Mark's gospel singled out as being loved by Jesus. And Jesus does not scold him or shame him, but in a loving way, Jesus directs him to get rid of his stuff. The stuff that defines him, the stuff that delights him, the stuff that makes him feel safe and secure and protected and better than, the stuff that signifies to himself and to others that he is especially blessed by God. Even Peter and the disciples who were most likely from the lower class and whose perspective had been shaped by a culture that associated wealth with honor and status and divine favor are flummoxed by the whole conversation. And they ask Jesus, if not him, then who possibly can be saved? Because in their culture, as in ours, wealth is often seen as a sign of God's blessing. That is not Jesus' message. Nowhere in the Gospels or during his ministry does he celebrate individual success or achievement, or big bank accounts, or lots and lots of belongings. And he does not equate economic wealth with godliness. Jesus advocates for relationships, for treating other people as children of God. He encourages a system of economic justice in which abundance is shared, not hoarded, and conditions are created whereby all people live in freedom and peace. He builds beloved community, the kingdom of God that is not constrained by rules of status, power, privilege, prestige, and human expectation. He builds a community where the last will be first and the first will be last. So let's sit with that on this first Sunday of Lent, especially if it makes us anxious and uncomfortable. We live in the wealthiest nation on the planet, and by most standards, every single one of us is a wealthy person with a lot of stuff. It is hard enough to follow Jesus as a faithful disciple to live by his standard of self-sacrifice, self-denial, and sharing, to find our meaning and purpose and identity and security and hope and promise in someone whose message is absolutely contradictory to everything our world tells us we should be and desire and strive for. And our stuff only makes it more challenging. I got no easy answers for you folks. <laughs> I have a lot of stuff too. And while it's easier to get rid of now than it was earlier in my life, I absolutely have not let it all go. Over the next six Sundays, I'm preaching a sermon series called Giving It Up for Lent. And I hope it's a gentle invitation for each of us, myself included, to reflect on what it is in our own lives that gets in the way of us being and living the way Christ calls us to be and to live and what we might give up, even our stuff. May it be so. Amen.